hand you over now to Julian T, our first speaker. All yours, Julian. Thanks, Kevin. So, morning, morning. Let me just try and uh, share the screen here. Put the slides up. Uh, has that worked so far or not? Yes, we're, uh, yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. So thanks very much. So um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, as Kevin says, it's Julian T. So uh, Compass Hotels Management is my little business uh, and a focus on uh, providing um, business strategy services really to predominantly independent hotels uh, and hospitality businesses. Um, and the basis of that has been over the last 30 years of experience, as, as Kevin mentioned. Um, the, the Compass bit, uh, just to avoid any confusion, nothing to do with Compass uh, catering, Compass hospitality, Compass anything else. Um, the Compass bit comes out of Compass Hotels Limited, uh, which was a company that I uh, operated for uh, 15 years as managing director. Um, and uh, that was from about 2000 to 2015. And we owned a series of hotels and we operated others under management agreements for other people. Um, I'm going to look at dynamic business planning today, uh, just over the next 15 minutes. Uh, and if I can rattle through this particular presentation uh, and take any questions as Kevin mentioned in the in the format that he spoke of, uh, just at the end of that, then be happy to do that. So, without any further ado, uh, dynamic business planning. So today we shall look at uh, why do we need a business plan? Um, what does it contain? Why should it be dynamic? How do we make it dynamic? And the last piece is making it a live document, keeping that alive to review and appraise. Um, every business really does need a business plan, of course, but frankly, it is amazing how few have them. Uh, and as Benjamin Franklin said at one point, uh, to fail to plan is, of course, to plan to fail. And I would argue that in the current climate, that particular comment was never truer. So let's dive into the first bit and why do we need a business plan? Um, well, your business plan, of course, will serve many purposes, and it's a direct descendant of the business strategy. And in simple terms, I would break that down as follows. So that business plan sets out the route map to achieve the business strategy, translates that strategy into bite-sized goals and objectives. That, in turn, drives communication with stakeholders and provides for measurement and performance. The breaking down into bite-sized goals and objectives, I think, is, is cardinal. Um, if you break things down into bite-sized chunks, leadership have an opportunity to delegate. They can communicate that out, and it allows other people to take those bite-sized chunks, to digest them, to interpret them, and to deliver against them. That communication through into stakeholders is important. And of course, if you've got those bite-sized chunks, you can start to provide measurement. And that measurement is important in normal times, and I'd argue will be important going forward as well. So the second topic was looking at what it contains. Um, and of course, it's going to vary from property to property and business to business. Um, but at the very, very least, I would recommend that it contains the following. So that would be your stated goals and objectives, of course, in your budgeted revenues and expenditure, in your comparative position to prior year, or potentially a prior year, let's face it, 2020 would not be the best benchmark, of course. Detailed analysis of each and every revenue center, each and every source of income, and the KPIs that are relevant to those revenue centers. Detailed analysis of each of the cost lines and a schedule of each element in that line. So I've seen uh, plans in the past which just list sales, marketing, and a number. Um, I would argue that you need a shopping list within those two particular categories alone. So you can see what you're spending or planning to spend uh, on your social media, on uh, even domain name registration, with which parties you're, uh, you're, you're sharing um, and which parties you're working with. At least if you can see that, you can start to evaluate the value of each and every one of those. And it does, it does you know, cause one or two people to wake up and, and, and look at what they're doing and how they're spending. Cash flow position. That is in green. We're going to come back to cash flow a little bit later. It's extremely important at present. Cash is without doubt king. Your resource plan, your sales plan per segment, and marketing plan per segment, 
and your revenue strategies per segment. Those four are in red because those are the truly dynamic element. That's where you turn on, you turn off, you pull the levers. And effectively, of course, that's akin to your plan A, your plan B. And I would argue in this particular year and next year, it's your plan C as well. So th there simply isn't time to deal with all of those subtopics in detail, but through the series of the Your Affordable Sales Team presentations, we have um, professionals who are speaking on those aspects. So uh, Robin Williams, uh, for example, uh, is picking up on uh, aspects of finance uh, on the 28th of uh, January. Um, and then uh, Claire, Martin, Kevin picking up on other aspects between sales, um, venue finding uh, and marketing. You might also want it to include your local competitor set, your national competitor set, international competitor set. Um, if people have a choice of spending money, where are they going to spend? It? They can spend it locally, nationally, or indeed internationally. So let's understand at least what the competitors are doing. And of course, that's going to vary for each type of business. And you need to look at what that is against each, uh, each revenue centre. SWOT analysis, I'm sure most are familiar with that, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, but also I would include a PEST or a PESTEL analysis, um, political, economic, social, um, technological factors, and the E and the L being environmental and legal. If you can cite that you know the issues that lie ahead and will impact your industry, your market, your locale, that's going to be an important aspect when you're presenting or when this plan is being presented to stakeholders. I appreciate that not everyone around the table is going to be uh, involved with putting together uh, a full business plan or indeed presenting a business plan, but a lot of people around the table will influence it um, and there will be some indeed that need to feed into certain aspects of it. We just dwell on that on that pest analysis, that pestel analysis at the moment. We've got a, an interesting scenario coming up for the 31st of March. We've got debt and rent moratoriums due to end. We've got VAT deferred payments due to end. We've got VAT, I think, reverting to 20%. We've got C-bills and B-bill schemes ending um, and business rates relief ending as well. Furlough, of course, carries on until the end of April. But at the moment, and the Chancellor said yesterday he's not looking to review any of those other plans until March itself, that provides huge uncertainty for business. And so again, it's important to reflect that aspect in the plan. But make sure you've got your accreditations that you've achieved and COVID compliance measures. That's important and we'll show why that's important a little bit later on with the associated costs. And finally, if you have an investment plan and any disruption analysis, I would absolutely be including that at this point. So why should it be dynamic? Well. Frankly, none of us know what the immediate future holds. And if you find someone who does, if you could put them in touch with me, I'd be most grateful. So your plan has to reflect business uncertainty. Your stakeholders need to know that you've considered that uncertainty. They need to see that you've reflected changes in business circumstances. They need to have confidence in you that you're in control of all that you can be. And frankly, you can't be in control of everything at the moment. They need to be reassured that your customers can trust you. We're back to the COVID compliance measures. How can people book with you? Can they book with confidence? And they need to know that you as a team are on the same page. So with, when you're putting plans together, you need to be asking yourself, you know, does the plan stack up? Um, are my actions defensible? Uh, are my actions achievable? And frankly, do my actions uh, that I'm putting in place, are they consistent with my resourcing and my market position? Think about what you did in lockdown. Think of what you could replicate, what worked and what didn't work, what you could replicate if we have lockdown 4.0, um, or indeed what happens with the tier system. And of course, what might happen in winter 2021 when we get to that point at the end of the year. I'd also argue heavily that your team deserve to know that you've thought about all these aspects as well. At the end of the day, it's your team's livelihoods that are at stake here too. It's not going to be possible to save everybody's job. It's not going to be possible for every business to be saved. But where you are planning, you have a duty as a leader to think about your team. Rose is going to pick up on teams in her presentation later on today. So I won't speak more on that right now. 
So how do we uh, continue to make it dynamic? Well, you'll remember we had those four aspects that were in red. So it's the resourcing plan, it's the sales plan, it's the marketing plan, it's the revenue strategies. It's a fleet of foot approach to those aspects. And it's about having a playbook and scenario planning. So back in, I think it was May 2020, uh, Black Sheep Restaurant in Hong Kong uh, produced a COVID-19 playbook. Um, and it, it went viral effectively. Um, if you don't have a copy of it, it's available online. I would find it. And if not, I can send you a copy of it. But a lot of businesses looked at that and they used that for their own business planning. If this happens, then I will do. If this, then that. Um, and it is an extremely useful way um, to approach business planning uh, for this year and for next year. It at least shows that you've thought about the uncertainties um, that it could impact your business and that you're prepared. Think about your sales mix. Any change in sales mix will increase or decrease income. Certain costs can be uh, adjusted, of course, with that, but not all. And you need scenarios that look at that. Show the revenue streams associated with those sales mixes and show your market segmentation and always state your assumptions. Think about your sensitivity planning as well and under, understand the effects of plus or minus a pound on ADR, plus or minus a percentage point on occupancy, plus or minus a percentage point on cost of sales or GP, whichever way you look at it. And make sure that you are plotting those common uh, denominators, those common uh, reporting lines of RevPAR, GoPAR, TrevPAR, and be able to show the effect on those metrics of a change in your sales mix. Think outside the box a little bit with measurements too. So again, this will all be uh, depending on the type of business that you're operating and what works and where. But if you look at your segmentation and you determine the most profitable sources of each revenue stream and focus on that, a laser focus on that, effectively it's Pareto's law, it's the 80-20 principle. 80% of your uh, revenue or 80% of your profit is coming from 20% of your market. Focus on that 20% at present. It comes back to cash flow, it comes back to cash being king. Rev PAG, revenue per available guest, F&B wise. Rev PASH, this was new to me, Rev PASH, revenue per available seat hour. Depends on what type of business you are, of course, but if you're breaking down that business plan into bite-sized chunks and you can measure, then you can break down into these sorts of metrics. These sorts of metrics might show where you need to focus energies. It might allow you to reward depending on, uh, on, on whether it's appropriate for your business or not. But these are useful metrics to look at. And I guess in that respect, you know, know what good looks like. And if it helps, work back from that position. So we're on to the last little bit, review and appraise. This needs to be a live document. It can't sit on the shelf. It has to feed into your forecasting and your forecasting frequency. And I would make that weekly. Have someone in the business take that down to cash flow level. Cash flow comes back in. It's a key skill. It needs to be right. It needs to be an accountant. It needs to be your, your FC within the business, or it needs to be an outsourced function if that's the way that it works. It's all spreadsheet based. If you need a tool for it, then, then the hotel forecast tool, for example, through the Russell Hotel Technology uh, platform is available. And that looks at a two year position. Um, I think it costs about 400 pounds or so, um, but it's, it's, it's an interesting tool. But it will take your PL down to cash flow. And of course, you can be making cash, but you can still run out of money. State really clearly the proportions of your business on the books in your forecast, that confirmed provisional inquiry position. And frankly, if it isn't confirmed, I wouldn't be including it in the forecast, but I would within my forecast be showing where my provisional and my inquiry levels of business are and how they're moving. And that of course comes into plotting pace. Clearly state your assumptions in your forecast and keep a copy of it, don't overwrite it. Reference data in the marketplace that supports your position, you know, STR, hot stats, local business surveys, uh, visit Britain forecasts, uh, BDRC sentiment reports, UK hospitality email updates, stuff that's supporting what you're doing is fundamental to evidence your position. You know, tourism recovery plan, all these things help. And of course, what's happening locally as well. And so finally, I'm not quite sure where I am on time, but finally, um, 
2021 is going to be strange, isn't it? You know, it's definitely going to be a game of two halves. I can't see how it can be anything different to half one and half two. We're in lockdown 3.0 till the end of March. Maybe, maybe longer, maybe less. I'm not certain. But short term strategies are going to be built around business survival. Uh, and in that respect, objectives are going to be different. And some of that's going to be very, very different and alien to the team. Therefore, it is important to communicate the plan. It's important to adopt a dynamic approach to business, to be prepared for change and to understand that change needs planning. And finally, and you'd probably expect me to say this, wouldn't you? Don't be afraid to ask for help. And that's me. Thank you. Kevin, back to you. Thank you very much, Julian. Could you unshare your screen, please? I have stopped. Thank you very, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I, I do have a couple of questions uh, for you based on uh, your uh, presentation, Julian. And uh, Go for it. the first one is, oh, well, actually, they're both from John Lee. Um, when do you believe hospitality will restart? It's a good question, isn't it? So, so um, there was a there was a presentation a little while ago, a couple of weeks ago now, uh, and um, Peter Ducker was looking at that and was 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 talking about when when hospitality might come back into the fore and and, and indeed what segments might come back at what point, um, and he, he gave quite a long list of things. Um, I would agree with some of it, not all of it, um, but I think much of this is going to depend on on uh, domestic tourism and travel. Uh, and for my part, I can see that starting to open up probably at the end of April, May time. Uh, I think a lot of it will depend on schools going back. I think a lot of it will depend on uh, the success rate of these vaccinations. But of course, there's, 12, there's a 12 week period, I think, if I'm right, between one vaccination and, and a booster with some of this. So you know, there's still a three month period there of risk um, for people traveling. So for my part, if, I'm, if I was planning here, I would be taking quite a gloomy view on April, May and June and subject to where my business is positioned, be that um, coastal, be that um, uh, you know, domestic tourism as, as the, or, or uh, regional tourism and domestic tourism as, as my main source of business, then I'd be looking at that from probably June onwards. And I would be taking at present, I would be taking quite a gloomy view of what November and December looks like, because I'm uncertain as to as to um, where things are going with the success of vaccines and whether you know there could be another uh, variation in in the strand. So so I'd be taking a slightly gloomy view on things, but but that's the way I tend to approach forecasting. Um, but I th for my part, for my part, and others may well uh, take a view on this. Um, I think that domestic. Uh, tourism and travel is going to probably open up from about April, May onwards, slowly, slowly. International, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. International for me with probably July time onwards, if I was forecasting some international business. And corporate business, um, you know, um, uh, regional corporate, maybe May, June time. But international corporate, I'd be very sceptical on personally. Mm. Thank you, Julia. And to be fair, to, to back up on that, talking to some of the agents of, of late, and uh, Karen may be able to uh, back me up on this, quite a few of them are, are thinking that they've lost most of their meetings business for quarter one. Quarter two is looking very dodgy. And uh, for the rest of the year, the, the general consensus is that it will be subject, this is subject obviously to change in um, restrictions, etc but it will be smaller meetings going forward and that the larger meetings will be of a, a hybrid or, or virtual type events. Again, with uh, international events, uh, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of big associations now talking about doing uh, either fully virtual or hybrid with having um, sort of regionals. So you might have, with an international event, you may have a UK contingent meeting in Birmingham, for example, and the French contingent meeting somewhere else, and then they would all connect via via uh, hybrid type events. So leading so, on, so, so that, that brings in a, a fundamental point about about having 
uh, you know, that key element of broadband and that provision mm. and it being stable and there being enough bandwidth for people, um, you know, to, so that so at least you can sell that solution with confidence. Mm. Um, but but that's by no means that's by no means um, uh, settled in in, uh, in in a lot of independent properties. Certainly. No, and, and that's something that we're trying to champion with some of our venues, some of our uh, venues that we work with, is that they really do need to look at their uh, their broadband width, and is it is it stable enough to do virtual and hybrid events, especially when you start going. Uh, we were talking to one agency, and they they started off doing small hybrid events and virtual events, and now they're doing international ones of uh, three, four thousand people across the world. Uh, in 15 different languages. God forbid. Anyway, uh, moving on, uh, we have another question from John. Uh, you, you mentioned leading into Rose's presentation, which is due to come up next, uh, a resourcing plan. Uh, what might this look like, Julian? No, I think, again, that's going to be different for each business. You know, what, what can you afford? Um, and affordability is, is, is an important point at this stage. Um, what's needed to achieve those goals where's your where is your revenue coming from where do you anticipate that coming from so where are you going to focus your your uh, uh, energies um, and that's going to impact where you, you resource um, how can it be flexible is it right to be employing or should you be outsourcing some of those functions at the moment um, and perhaps getting greater economy through outsourcing that might be a case in point. Um, and I think also with that, looking at the value that each of those team members bring. So how flexible is that workforce? Um, flexibility within the workforce is not just giving people different jobs to do, of course, it's training them to do the different jobs. A, a wonderful element of multitasking, go and do this, but I don't know how to do it. You know, so, so, so I think it's about having that flexible workforce. And I think, in, in part, that will the, the success of that will come back down to how leadership have interacted with their teams during periods of lockdown or closure. Um, whether people can just you know suddenly pitch up and crack on, some will be motivated to do that, others will need need to be nurtured back in. And, and frankly, that's that's starting to encroach a little bit on Rose's presentation. So I, I won't I won't dwell on that. Um, it might be a useful segue into Rose's presentation, um, but but in summary answer, I think I think that it will very very much depend on where are you focusing your efforts, um, who are the players on your team you want to put out on the pitch, because you generally speaking want to put out your best eleven or your best thirteen or your best fifteen, shall we say? Um, where can they help to drive revenues for you? And I'm being pretty laser focused on that because there are some unfortunate decisions, unpalatable decisions that businesses will have to make this year for business survival. And that's going to be an evolving strategy piece, an evolving plan behind that, and that's going to affect the workforce. Um, and so I think it will be different depending on each business, but where can you channel your energies through your team to drive revenues and generate cash for you in order to continue the business? Bit of a gloomy end that one sorry thank you julian uh and the quite quite a lot has been covered by julian in his presentation and with the slides that we send out later um there will be a slide that has got everyone's contact details on if you want to continue the the conversation about the content of julian's um, presentation please feel free to contact him uh, his mobile number is there his email address is there and the same goes for Rose. And if you need any more information about what we do from uh, your affordable sales team, uh, Venue Queen or Trident, feel free to contact us. Without further ado, uh, I think we're, uh, sorry, before we move on to Rose, has anyone else got any more questions for Julian? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Rose, over to you, my dear. Thank you. Morning, everyone. How are we today? Oh, lovely. Oh, because I was just about to say, let's quickly check in. How are you all today? Give me a thumbs up or a wave for those of you still on screen and the others behind. behind. Yes. 
Um, it's really lovely to see uh, some familiar faces and to see some new, and it's a pleasure to meet you virtually, for those I haven't uh, met before. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, everyone see that okay? Lovely, that's what we like. Uh, okay, and Julian, thank you ever so much. Um, that was really, really interesting. And uh, of course, you're going to need a motivated and engaged team to deliver your business plan. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm going to look at. Um, so I know Kev gave me a, a very nice uh, introduction, um, but a bit you might not know about me is uh, I've worked in hospitality some <coughs> 35 years, but obviously I look a lot younger. You can all agree if you like. Um, but seriously, in November 2019, uh, I did a uh, mental health first aid uh, uh, training. And um, initially I did this because I wanted to better understand and support a close friend of mine who was going through some quite um, heavy stuff. And um, something that really stood out for me on the training was that one in four people experience at least one diagnosable mental health issue in one year. So let's take a moment to think about that. One in four. So we probably all know someone who's had a mental health challenge, but have they told us, have they shared that with us? And that scary figure of one in four has really inspired me towards a counselling qualification. So I'm, I'm on my level three at the minute. I've got a little bit of way to go, uh, but I found it really useful um, for me personally, but also my professional life, because I'm just more aware of, uh, you know, the people I'm dealing with, particularly when I'm, I'm training, uh, people might have external issues that they're dealing with that day. So I'm really passionate about the subject, so don't get me started or shut up. Um, but um, so what I'm going to do in this 15 to 20 minute um, session is share my thoughts and observations on um, helping you support, motivate and engage your teams coming back to work and um, really with a special focus being on well-being support. Okay, so let's give a go on the slide. Like my road there, your road map. <laughs> so, um, you know, I've been thinking about how to, to uh, visually uh, do this presentation really. And um, thinking about the steps back to work, um, I thought I'd put a roadmap together, which I hope will, will be helpful. So I thought I'd call it the return to work journey um, because we have to take several steps um, to get to where we want to be. Sometimes there's a few bumps in the road for some of us. It's not always the easiest quick trip, um, but um, uh, you know, let, let's look at the steps that, that might help. And so much has changed in the world and um, there's so much to get used to and get our head around. And gosh, you know, I was thinking, where do, you, where do we start? Where do we start on the, you know, the year that we've had so far? You know, what a tumultuous and uncertain year for all of us. And that's professionally, personally, um, but, but it's also a time for change, perhaps. Creativity and opportunity of doing things differently um, in the future. So it's going to be really important re-engaging our teams um, into, the, into the right mindset. Um, and that will then be a key for success. So along with your business planning, you need to have your engaged and motivated team behind you. And I think, you know, we probably all feel a bit fragile and have anxieties uh, and worries uh, on our mind. And, you know, and so will our teams returning to work. Um, and although we're in lockdown, this is an opportunity to get ready to welcome and encourage our teams um, back to work. Um, and then, you know, this is about building a strong well-being or human, if you like, company culture uh, and, and really uh, a basis of putting people first. So my suggestion is if you haven't got something like that in place, I'm sure you are having regular um, conversations with your team members uh, and colleagues 
start planning this now. Um, so what I'm going to do is I've put these steps together and I hope that they'll be helpful and we'll work through these over the next 15 uh, to 20 minutes. So the first step is reassurance. And this is about being human, putting people first, consider people's safety, uh, their mental health and well-being, and, and having a, a culture about being open and supportive about any anxieties um, they may have. And I think it's about giving people time to settle in. And I, what I will do is I'll assume you've got all the safety protocols in place. Gosh, I think we're all pretty used to those now, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all uh, got used to that personally and uh, in our businesses. Um, so the next step would be about um, re-engaging people. So we've, we've got the, the wellbeing culture in place. Um, and this is about reintroducing your team uh, to business and uh, also recognition of how they've contributed. Um, they'll also be looking for job security and opportunities for growth. And I'll go into that a bit about actually how important that is um, to people. Um, and the next step, really, once you've done that, is to, um, is to think about retraining. Jobs might have been reassigned. I've certainly heard of, of that quite a bit. Uh, you know, new skills might be needed. Uh, some people are working in, in two or three different departments because they're covering different roles. Um, and, and what also might have happened is there might be new business goals, new operating standards, the values of vision and values of the company have changed. So we need to be really clear about that for people. What are the goals and objectives? Um, and I know Julian talked about this um, as well. The next step, can you see here, they'll all start with R see what I've done. <laughs> uh, so this step is, uh, we'll talk about realigning working practices. So this is kind of thinking about how the work landscape has changed. You know, a lot of us are working from home now, uh, uh, that the hours might be more flexible. You might need to think about locations where people are working, you know, and, and, and their role, you know, what, what do you expect from them? Um, and also, you know, what are their current personal circumstances? I mean, many of us are schooling from uh, our kids at home and uh, my colleague Sarah, we can't really um, uh, communicate really during the day because she's got the kids now and uh, it's quite amazing what, as five-year-olds what she has to teach them. <laughs> she has a lesson planner every day, you know, and so her time of work is in the evening. So, and we work around that as, as a team because that, you know, that works for her. So we need to think about that. And the last uh, one is relate. So I mean, really with that is relationships. Um, so this is um, about ongoing working relationships, that sense of belonging, the culture of working in an open atmosphere, good and clear communication, um, you know, it's, it's colleagues supporting each other and the line manager, manager relationships. And it's also, uh, Julian said, it's about regular business updates. Share that with your teams. That's really, really important. OK, so I'm, I'm going to stop talking for a minute. Don't be sad. <laughs> so uh, I'm assuming everyone's used chat before. Uh, so uh, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a chat uh, function. Um, and I'd really like to get your thoughts about how you think um, people are feeling about coming back to work. Uh, they might have been furloughed or they've been working from home all this time. Um, you know, some, some people are working now, of course, but some will be going back um, into face-to-face -face, uh, roles when, when we're allowed. So just type into chat how you think people will be feeling at the moment, um, you know, in your teams or how you're feeling at the moment too. Just one, one or two words, you know, your, your thoughts, that'd be great, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, apprehensive, nervous, some will be energised, absolutely, yes. We've got a real mixture there, I think, of, of anxiety, uh, but also people can't wait to get 
um, seeing their uh, colleagues again, seeing guests again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, looking forward to anxious. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. So absolutely agree with that. I think it's only normal, we're only human. Um, so you've got anxieties, might be worried, uh, a bit nervous, but there's also some excitement as well. And, uh, you know, that I think we all crave to get back. <laughs> seeing people again, don't we? And, um, you know, seeing our, our guests and our, our clients again. So we need to proactively support our teams. So having some procedures and tools in place uh, for when they return to work means we really want everybody, not just a few, to feel excited and motivated, don't we? And, you know, look forward to, to seeing their colleagues and um, guests again. OK, so let's think about how we can um, offer that reassurance. I put this picture there and I thought people are going to say, you can't touch people. <laughs> This is a metaphorical uh, illustration. So we, we, we can't physically reassure our colleagues like this at the moment, um, but we can create a culture of support and wellbeing that is kind of metaphorically handholding, if you like. Um, and if you think about it, um, if, if somebody starts a job, a new job, it might take them about three months to settle in and uh, sometimes longer and we support them with full induction plans reviews you know we talk to them all the time to help them through it if you think about the backdrop we're in now people are coming back to work can we honestly expect our teams on day one to pick up where they left off you know so we need to apply the same sorts of support there for them okay so another one for you in chat how many workers do you think will experience anxiety, depression, or problems relating to stress at any one time? So I'm going to give you some options. You can just type one of these in. Do you think it's one in 12, one in eight, one in six, or one in 10? So how many workers will experience anxiety, depression, or stress at any one time, one in 12, one in eight, one in six, or one in 10. Right, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So I've got a mixture there of uh, one in six, one in eight, one in 10. Um, yeah, Gavin, you've picked up that it might be worse during because of lockdown as well. Yeah, one in six. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I think, yeah, we've got a mixture mainly of one in six, one in eight. So it's actually one in six. So you're right there. Uh, they'll experience depression, anxiety or problems relating to stress at any one time. So that I just find that one in six, that's really common. And think about the size of your team. I think that really puts it into perspective. One in six. So I thought um, it might be really interesting to share some um, other stats with you from Mental Health First Aid England. And uh, I have there are so many, but I just pulled out some key ones I thought you'd be interested. And um, I, I went through a lot of this on the Mental Health First Aid uh, course. But again, I think this just puts this into perspective. And these are UK uh, figures. So this, you know, from research in 2018-19, stress, depression, or anxiety were responsible for 44% of all cases of work-related ill health. And 54% of all working days lost due to health issues. That was 2018, 2019. So imagine what the landscape looks like now. And here is, here, here is, you'll like this one, Julian, this is a figure. <laughs> the Centre for Mental Health states that mental health at work costs the UK economy 34.9 billion a year. 
every year it costs a business £1,300 per employee where their mental health needs are unsupported. You can imagine if you're in a business with quite a few people, you know, that, that's not so, it, it's just so key. It's such a thing we need to really have part of our everyday way of, of working. We talk about absenteeism. We, we, you know, with that, we tend to think about general stuff, probably like um, people off sick, uh, you know, got a flu or something, or what we've got now, should leave us. Uh, a time off for uh, bereavement, maybe, or they're, they're on holiday. Um, but, you know, there are other reasons sometimes people are off that you don't know about. They, they maybe not tell you. Um, so actually one in five people take a day off due to stress. And this is interesting. 90% of these people cited a different reason for their absence to their employers. But they didn't feel that, you know, I, I don't know if there, there does always seem to have been a bit of a stigma, doesn't there? And I know that's improved a lot with what's been going on lately. But the cup 90% cited a different reason for their absence um, and I think that's that's um, that's sad and 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 this one really shocked me as well nine percent of employees who disclose mental health issues to their line manager so they did actually share what was going on nine percent reported being disciplined dismissed or demoted I find that quite shocking and, but I think, is that a lack of understanding or is it a lack of a supportive culture of well-being? You know, so it really is something to think about. So, chat again, please. I'd really like to know if any of you have come across the term presenteeism at work, presenteeism at work, and what you think that means. Just, just type a few words in what you think pre presenteeism at work means. there but not there, there in body but not in mind, being there in person and mind. Lights on but no one being at home, perception, being there in person, mind elsewhere, present but not there in mind. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a term that, you know, you've got that really, is they are actually at work, they are at their desk or they're, you know, in the hotel or wherever doing their work. But what it means is they're coming to work when they shouldn't. Uh, they could be sick, they've got, you know, mental health issues, they might be working really, really long hours, um, or they've got external issues going on that are really affecting their work. So although they're present at work, they're not being productive. And I think sometimes we've worked with people and you think, what have they done all day? You know, and you have this, this perception of, God, you know, what's going on there? And, you know, we just don't know what's going on for them personally. And so presenteeism accounts for two times more losses than absences. So it is, you know, it's really important. We've again got this culture and we're, we're talking about all of this. And this is interesting too. 69% of line managers say that supporting employee well-being is a core skill. You know, they believe it's a skill they should have, but only 13% have received mental health training. 35% of line managers reported a wish for basic training in common mental health conditions. You know, we want to know, I think, there's much more of an appetite to know. So again, when you think about planning what your well-being culture is going to look like, then this, this can be part of it. What I do want to do is share some positive news. <laughs> is where mental health issues are diagnosed, most are actually treatable. And through right support, most people will fully recover. Um, you know, or be able to manage it day to day. So, you know, it's just that people just 
need to be able to feel that they can talk about it. So let's think about um, where you can go for advice or training if you kind of, you know, perhaps don't know where to where to start with it or you'd like a bit more information. Um, so, you know, just to say, uh, it's not a broad brush here. Every organization's culture is um, unique um, and creating change around the mental health um, topic is, is complex. Um, so it's gonna require a multi-tiered approach but there are various organizations that, that can help you with this as well. So I've got some up on the, the slide here. Uh, so Mental Health First Aid England, uh, there's an organization called Stress Matters. There's a fantastic uh, Laura and James through there who are, who are brilliant. Um, uh, ch there's charities, Mind, Mental Health UK. There, there's lots of great resources out there. And also there's a lot of help tools on a government website as well there's a big thing about that um, support for businesses as well as individuals so I'd, I'd definitely say have a look at that um, so organizations for instance like mental health first aid and and uh, stress matters they offer online training at the moment when I went it was face to face but obviously things have changed at the moment so you can still have mental health first aid training um, and uh, I know Stress Matters do it, and they'll do it across, um, I think, four or five mornings across a week. So you're not out of the business, you know, it's just a little bit every day. It's quite a heavy topic, obviously, to look at. Uh, and you'd also get sent this, uh, oh, I've got it here, I've got this massive. Oh, get this massive book as well, which is great because you can refer to that. And that's got loads of helpline numbers and all sorts of things for you. Um, you can also look at mental health first aid champions in your business, um, just becoming mental health aware. Everyone can go on this. It's a half day. Um, mental health awareness for line managers. I recently sat in on that. Um, and I know some of you here today have had uh, some of this training and, and have told me you found it, you know, really, really useful. The other thing that's uh, happening more now is um, employee assistance programs or EAPs. So I don't know if any of you've uh, come across those. Um, what, what that means is you'll work with an organisation providing this. Um, and this gives employees 24-7, 365 days a year wellbeing support. So they can just go on, have a look at uh, webinars, fact sheets, articles, um, you can you know, have an app on your phone as well, so you can access it at any time. Um, and uh, there are self-help programmes. Uh, you can have like uh, uh, counselling, online counselling. Uh, you can have online health checks and there's a confidential helpline. So I think really as a minimum, this is something that, you know, you could put in place if you haven't already, uh, you know, pretty quickly, really. Um, and then, you know, employees who, f who feel uh, you know, there's proactive caring support on their side, um, you know, you'll find their well-being is enhanced and, um, you know, you can use it too, of course. Uh, absence levels will, will start to reduce and your productivity will, will increase. So EAPs are becoming much more common now. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about this as well, you know, if I was looking for a new job, I'm going to be kind of wanting to see that an organisation places well-being as a priority um, you know what sort of things can have they got in place to help me uh, or to go to if I if I need to uh, who can I talk to at work if I need to so you know again having this in place is, is, is really valuable um, I'm sure a lot of you are I'm a member of the Institute of Hospitality um, and they've just launched uh, support for its members um, uh, employee assistance program uh, and they're doing this through Health Assured, and they're one of the main uh, companies that do this. Um, but there's Booper, AXA, whatever, of the similar things. Um, and um, so, you know, I thought that was great. And I'm a member and I'm not paying for that. They're offering that, which is in the industry, I think is, is I haven't seen that anywhere else in a membership organisation. So, you know, I think that's that's great. So you could always have a look at that and, see, you know, see what see what you think first. Um, so, you know, you've put in place your um, safety, uh, your mental health and well-being support. 
So now we need to look onto the next stage, which is re-engaging your team. And so apart from ensuring you have um, regular one-to-ones, um, you know, you, now is the time to engage your teams and they're going to want to know they've got job security and, uh, you know, uh, opportunities for uh, growth as well and career progression, because that's really important to people. Um, so let's have a look at that. Wow. So he's a bit engaged, this guy, you could say. He looks pretty tuned in. Uh, he's probably had a few more, few than a, more than a few coffees this morning <laughs> or something else. But, we, you know, I don't know. It's not for me to say. Um, but again, just to give you a bit of research here, um, findings from recent research at Learning Magazine show that, uh, yes, remuneration, benefits and rewards um, are common ways to show your teams are valued. Uh, you know, at this time, you might that might not be quite so viable to offer financial rewards um, and incentives in the short term. It could be something you work towards, but, you know, things are tough at the moment. Um, but I'd like to think about, again, in chat, um, have a think about what percentage of employees value recognition above or over rewards or gifts. What percentage do you think of employees valuing recognition above rewards or gifts. I sort of briefly touched on that earlier. Yeah, 75%, 85%, high percentage, 75%, 70%, 80%. Seventy-five percent. Yeah, absolutely. You're all very perceptive there. Over eighty percent of employees value recognition above any rewards um, or gifts. So we can do that, can't we? We can recognise people. We can thank them. We can thank them for their contribution. You know, if people feel appreciated, they're more actively engaged straight away, don't they? They know that what they do is um, recognised. So I think we can all relate to that. I'm definitely a person who needs um, praise. They can give me some afterwards, that's fine. <laughs> so people are um, more engaged if they can see there is potential for them to grow and develop the career in your organisation. So, you know, you might not be able to do something now, but, you know, just, just think about that. And, you know, who, whoever is in your team, there might have been quite a lot of changes, actually. Just make sure they're reassured and they're recognised as part of the team. Remember to sit down with people individually and see how they are. Let them know that wellbeing support is available and find out from them uh, what their objectives, uh, their objectives, what, what, what they'd like out of role. But this is an opportunity for you to set clear objectives, goals and expectations as well. I think, you know, I think we'd all agree people really thrive on, on direction. So, you know, support and well-being, but also clear goals as well. So I'm not saying everyone's, you want everybody walking around like this crazy man. Uh, he looks like he's definitely had something, you know, maybe to, to get him that engaged. But, but you do want everyone to um, feel part of your company's vision and journey, I think. You really, you really do. Right, I can't look at this man anymore. Let's move him on. So the next step is about uh, retraining or training. Uh, people may have been reassigned new, uh, and they you know, need new skills. They may be, as we said before, doing several different roles. And you know, they need time to learn. They need time to um, settle in um, and um, you know, I was talking to a colleague the other day who does health and safety uh, training uh, and she was working with a, a team of housekeepers from a hotel and uh, she said they made the comment that, um, you know, uh, they, they haven't worked in a hotel or cleaned rooms for quite a while and there has to be uh, an understanding that um, from day one to go back in and do 20 rooms is going to be hard physically because the stamina is perhaps not there as it was before. 
as well as the, knowing all the new cleaning standards. So it's just kind of thinking, right, people perhaps they need to start on a few less rooms to start with and build up to, you know, just bear these things in mind. And God, don't we know, we're on it now, technology. It's become so technology heavy. I know it was always moving that way, but we have to help our teams with that. There's been new apps introduced for, to guests, uh, you know, for them to check in and to maybe order rooms, you know, all that sort of thing. And, and there's a lot more communication ta uh, taking place online. Um, so, you know, you need to ensure your teams know how to, how to use these tools and are, are comfortable with it. I mean, I sometimes, on my uh, counseling course, we use Microsoft Teams. So I don't know if any of you use that. I'm so used to Zoom. I feel like sometimes I'm a bit like, oh, I don't know what to do, you know, so I've got to, you know, get my head around that. But, um, you know, principles are generally the same. But, you know, we all still have to learn bits and pieces, you know. Um, so one of the things about training is, um, you know, make it make it available, make it accessible. Um, so one of the ways you can do this was, is with an online learning management system. Um, it's a great way to have 24 hour access uh, to online learning and, uh, you know, it builds consistency of key messages and procedures amongst all team members as well. So I'm going to share with you a little um, case study here uh, of um, a hotel group that we recently worked with called The Resident. So I don't know if any of you know the hotels at all. Uh, they're a luxury hotel group. They have... Um, uh, uh, four hotels in London and one in Liverpool. Uh, in the first lockdown, they decided they wanted to keep their furlough teams um, encouraged and engaged. And whilst training um, uh, was voluntary because they were on furlough, um, it, it, we've had some really great results. So um, there was a number of bes bespoke training units built with 10 main training modules. And these were accessible all the time, 24 seven on this uh, system. And during the first lockdown, 85% of furloughed team members were voluntarily consistently logging on. And to date, um, uh, 18 live online learning sessions have been carried out uh, and 65 training units. And their feedback is they say it's enabled them to stay motivated and um, you know, they're ready to return to work. Um, and, and they also felt the connection between their colleagues and managers uh, was really important as well so although they're all at home you know that that's all in place for them so that might be something um, to think about doing some um, online training that way and then we're just getting to the last couple of steps now um, reset so your traditional business model is going to probably have changed so think about changing working hours work locations um, and things like that Think about maybe short term working um, to reintroduce employees uh, to the workplace whilst uh, that potentially can reduce salary costs. Think about how the business can contribute and supporting the local community as well. People find giving something back uh, is extremely rewarding and good, you know, for their engaging and, and their well being as well. But above all, allow them time to readjust. You know, this is about providing support, keeping everyone safe and creating that um, sense of belonging. And then the last um, one to look at is relate or relationships. We know it hasn't been busy over the last year and we've had a tough time personally and professionally. And guess what? We're only human. We're only human. Um, so. When we think about um, our teams, you know, it's it, all it is is about developing a positive mindset and building resilience. So I just want to quickly show you this. Probably back to front. <laughs> this little book here, just to show you uh, how I think this is so great. So you know, Timpsons. The uh, shoe repairers, key cutters, whatever, pretty much all of them are at a supermarket. They produced this uh, guide to mental health at work. Um, 
to help colleague, colleagues cope with stress and depression. And it's lovely, it's just very simple, you know, illustration. I actually bought this for a pound in Timpsons. So they've actually, they're selling them to uh, their customers. This was published in 2019. So I think what an amazing uh, commitment to the employees and community. Uh, and the proceeds also go towards uh, Heads Together charity. So I just wanted to see you to the extent that some organisations are going to. So I just kind of want to say that it's okay to let people know the future might look different to what we all expected. You know, it's not a weakness as a business. It's a sign of transparency and looking to the future. It's okay to say you're processing some issues and you don't have all the answers. Things are changing all the time. And it's okay to let people know there'll be some changes without being able to give details yet. But I think the thing here is that, and, and um, Julian said this, transparency is key. Transparency builds trust. And it does reinforce the message that we're all in this together. So it is about keeping communication up, uh, both business and personal, and, and remembering your team's well-being. You know, regular business updates are, are really important. So that's uh, that's the journey. That's the journey. In that's what I think. That <laughs> um, if you, I think ultimately, if your teams are looked after. They're motivated, engaged, trained and informed. You're going to have this great ethos and that ensures your teams are happy and, and you know, they'll relate to your guests, your customers and offer amazing guest service. So I just want to say that, you know, we're only human. Be aware of each other and how individual we all are. Show empathy and listen. You know, ask how are you today and uh, I think it's okay you don't have to have all the answers just know that listening is enough sometimes so really we've been on a relentless cycle of pauses I saw this picture and I thought yeah it's pause restart pause restart isn't it it's just been happening all the time so let's look towards positive restart plan Keep talking to team members and have regular one-to-one. -one. And it's this thing, check in on them daily, check in on them. And I know that uh, it'd be great to be around our families and colleagues and guests again. Um, industry Have an industry bash here and there would be amazing. Um, I know I definitely need to get a few catch-ups in and a few sherries here and there maybe. So I do hope my thoughts have been helpful. Um, I'm around after this session if anyone wants to chat as well. But thank you very much. Thank you, Rose. Um, the, the mental health of the teams are, is, is, is key, I think, going forward. And uh, you know, we've all suffered in some way, shape or form. And uh, I know so relating to one of our venues, one of um, when they did open up for a few weeks, uh, the person I was talking to was saying, it's amazing, my team have done this job for 10, 15 years or more. So they walk in and it's all of a sudden you realise that they've forgotten everything and you're having to work and support them and get them through it. But yeah, and, and that was that came very true. Uh, a couple of questions for you, Rosebud. Yeah. Um, let me just find them. Work like that. Ha, uh, this one uh, for you, Rose, is how and where would I start putting together a mental health and well-being culture in place? Yeah, well, I think probably uh, you know a good starting point is to is to perhaps work with an organisation to help you do that. Uh, it's quite complex. There's a lot of things. And, you know, when we think about 
well-being you might want to think about health you know the health physical health the support as well um you know there's a spiritual side for some people there's quite a lot involved in in well-being um so i would yeah i would say uh, the um the charities that i've mentioned and but also uh stress matters uh one of the things they do is is help put cultures work with, and put a culture into an organization and you know people are going to want different things maybe like the full the full support mechanism or or just part so they can really help and advise um i would suggest but there, there will be other organizations out there okay thank you and interestingly we've got laura from stress matters as one of our guest speakers at some stage in the future haven't we claire you're on mute right <laughs> yeah she's great she's great yeah. um we have another question. Uh, what are the costs involved to put team members on the mental health first aider courses and how many days and um, to implement an employee assistance? I'm not quite sure if I've read that correctly. Yeah. Um, OK, I mean, uh, on average, I think from what I've seen, it's probably about £300 uh, per delegate for mental health first aider, uh, but that does vary. Sometimes there are offers out there. Mine was a little bit more when I did it face to face, but I think the price is reduced a little bit because it's online and they will do it across uh, a week rather than two okay. full days. Um, so that's quite good. And then you normally get homework, I think, every evening. So I'd say around about that. But I mean, I think if there was a few of you being put on from one organisation, mm. you know, they might specifically do it for you and, and do something, I don't know. Do um, yeah, employee assistance programmes, um, uh, you know, that varies. You can have sort of ad hoc where you pay for things ad hoc if mm. if. Uh, team members uh, use the confidential line or what have you um, or um, you know you pay an amount per employee so uh, I mean I had a quick look at this uh, you know anything from £3.50 uh, an employee just to have the phone line or sort of £14 upwards if you're having the full uh, you know support tools there and it could be more I think perhaps if you start to want to have counselling as well um, but they've got fully qualified people on the end of the phone uh, who, who, yeah, qualified to offer, you know, support and counselling over the phone. They know what they're doing. Super. Thank you very much. Um, has anyone else got any more questions for Rose? Thank you all very much. Uh, just, just.